Oh. Okay, I'm reading from the New International Version, Genesis 19. The two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. When he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please turn aside to your servant's house. You can wash your feet and spend the night and then go on your way early in the morning. No, they answered, we will spend the night in the square. But he insisted so strongly that they did go with him and entered his house. He prepared a meal for them, baking bread without yeast, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called out to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may have sex with them. Reading again from the NIV, this is Romans chapter 1. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. When most of us were, were kids, we could only imagine homosexual sex occurring in places like the bathhouses in San Francisco. Such things were tolerated at best, yet here we are now not only tolerating it, but we're celebrating it as a culture. all the way. And when we were kids, the abortionists were the bad guys. If you watched them on TV or in movies, they were always <coughs> slithering around dark alleys and cheap motels. In fact, I saw a show from the 60s a couple months ago, I don't, Nick at Night or something. 
but these two policemen in blue uniforms chased down some man on a bicycle. They caught him and they took a metal tube away from him and inside that tube there were his instruments of abortion. And in that show they were disgusted with that man and he was ashamed of himself. In fact, my wife, a couple of years ago now, got this at a uh, garage sale. Saturday Evening Post, May 20th, 1961. Cost 15 cents. And the, the topic up here is a famous reporter investigates a widespread social evil abortion. So they've gone from being villains to being the heroes, the keepers of a woman's right to choose. And people like my daughter, Abra, who sidewalk councils outside of abortion clinics, they are considered weirdos and haters. In fact, Ashby and I and my daughter and her husband we were at a protest in front of Planned Parenthood in Tempe, and that was one of the standard labels they gave to us, was hater. But the real objects of the hate are those dead children under that 26 square miles of ground, the number of children who have been aborted in this country since 1973. Now, if you're like most in this country, abortion to you is just a word. I want to read something to you from Dr. Anthony Levitino. He's an OBGYN. He's practiced abortion for many years. He does so no longer. He performed over 1,200 abortions. He lost his own daughter when she was running across the street. She was hit by a car and he carried her to the hospital in his arms on the way she died. After that, every time he did an abortion, he felt like he was killing someone's son or daughter. He started doing abortions at younger ages. He couldn't deal with the guilt of doing it for older age children. But eventually he said to himself, the size doesn't make the person, and he stopped altogether. Now, he spoke last year and testified to Congress trying to get the insanity that's going on in this country to stop. Yes. And here's his description he gave to Congress of a typical abortion procedure. The first task is to remove the laminaria that had earlier been placed in the cervix to dilate it sufficiently to allow the procedure you are about to perform. With that accomplished, direct your attention to the surgical instruments arranged on a small table to your right. So remember, he's talking to congressmen. The first instrument, instrument you reach for is a 14 French suction catheter. It is clear plastic and about nine inches long. It has a bore through the center approximately three-fourths of an inch in diameter. Picture yourself introducing this catheter through the cervix and instructing the circulating nurse to turn on the suction machine, which is connected through clear plastic tubing to the catheter. What you will see is a pale yellow fluid that looks a lot like urine coming through the catheter into a glass bottle on the suction machine. This is the amniotic fluid that surrounded the baby to protect her. With suction complete, look for your sofa clamp. This instrument is about 13 inches long, made of stainless steel. At the end are located jaws about two and a half inches long and about three-fourths of an inch wide with rows of sharp ridges or teeth. This instrument is for grasping and crushing tissue. When it gets hold of something, it does not let go. A second trimester DNA abortion is a blind procedure. 
The baby can be in any orientation or position inside the uterus. Picture yourself reaching in with the sofa clamp and grasping anything you can. At 24 weeks gestation, the uterus is thin and soft, so be careful not to perforate or puncture the walls. Once you have grasped something inside, squeeze on the clamp to set the jaws and pull hard, really hard. You feel something let go, and out pops a fully formed leg about six inches long. Reach in again and grasp whatever you can. Set the jaw and pull really hard once again, and out pops an arm about the same length. Reach in again and again with that clamp and tear out the spine, the intestines, the heart, and the lungs. The toughest part of a D&E abortion is extracting the baby's head. The head of a baby that age is about the size of a large plum and is now free floating inside the uterine cavity. You can be pretty sure you have hold of it if the sofa clamp is spread about as far as your fingers will allow. You will know you have it right when you crush down on the clamp and see white gelatinous material coming through the cervix. That was the baby's brain. You can then extract the skull pieces and many times a little face will come out and stare back at you. Congratulations, you have just successfully performed a second trimester suction d &E abortion. You have just affirmed her right to choose. How have we gotten into this mess in this country? And it's only getting worse. Religious persecution has been going on in our country for, for some time. But within the last decade or so, it has accelerated. Here are some actual examples of religious persecution. This is in the public square. Federal Reserve Board demands bank remove religious Christmas decorations, December 2010. Obama administration tries to keep prayer off the World War II memorial, November 2011. The government bans prayer at homeless shelter, July 2012. Atheist group demands Vietnam Veterans Memorial be removed, February 7th, 2013. Atheist group threatens school for teaching two songs that mention God in music class, August 6th, 2012. Persecution in the education system. Atheist opposition to Merry Christmas Charlie Brown cancels school field trip, December 2012. School bans teachers from mentioning religion in personal biographies, January 22, 2013. Florida college student suspended for refusing to stomp on Jesus, March 2013. That was as part of a I believe it was a psych, a psych class. College student ordered to hide cross necklace, June 27th, 2013. Student told to stop bringing Bible to school for reading time, April 2014. And religious persecution in regards to sexuality. Christian photographer forced to photograph a same-sex wedding, September 2006. Bed and breakfast owner sued for refusing to rent room to same-sex couple in her own home, 2007. Christian group forced to host same-sex wedding in its boardwalk pavilion, June 2007. Kurt Schilling, baseball pitching great, fired from ESPN for saying men should use the men's room and not the ladies' room, 2016. And one out just a couple days ago. There is no room in our schools for discrimination of any kind, including discrimination against transgender students on the basis of their sex. Attorney General 
Loretta Lynch. If you hadn't heard, on that day, President Obama made a decree through the Department of Education that in all public schools in this country, if a little boy feels like he's a girl at a particular time, he can use the girl's bathroom, the girl's shower, the girl's locker room. How have we gotten into this mess? I believe a major reason for the mess we're in is because Christians have a misunderstanding of our role in society, especially as it relates to politics. You often hear Christians poo-poo political involvement. I don't get involved in politics. Our role in this life is to seek and save the lost. Our citizenship is in heaven, not on earth. We're to be in the world, but not of the world. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. Change hearts by the gospel message, and politics will take care of itself. Now, before we can talk intelligently about political involvement, with, as far as Christians are concerned, we have to know the definition of politics. Webster's Dictionary has three main definitions of politics. Number one, activities that relate to influencing the actions and policies of a government or getting and keeping power in a government. Number two, the work or job of people who are part of a government. Number three, the opinions that someone has about what should be done by governments, i.e. a person's political thoughts. If you buy anything, uh, raise your hand. <laughs> Do you buy uh, gasoline? Yeah. Do you pay uh, income tax? We all buy stuff. Most of us pay taxes every year. And our taxes go to run government services of some kind, which fits definition one of politics. And that is activities that influence the actions and policies of government and our taxes certainly influence the action of government. Without our taxes, there would be no government programs. Without our taxes, there would be no government. That's right. So if you buy food or gas and pay income tax, you are, by definition, involved in politics, whether you like that notion or not. Yep. You are involved in the maintaining of government and its activities. I'm sure you've all seen those Santas around Christmas time standing outside the uh, department stores with their usually a big black bucket ringing a bell. At uh, IHOP every now and then they'll have a table set up to, uh, for contributions to help uh, teenage boys deal with uh, drug addiction. A question. Would you blindly give money to a group that you knew nothing about? For instance, someone knocks on your door. He's asking for money for some organization. It's an organization you have never heard of. Would you give that person money? Would you help fund that organization? Would you give money to support a group that promotes activities that you are opposed to? For example, there are atheist groups that are now setting up summer camps for children so they can teach them the message of liberation from religious tyranny and bondage. Would you give money to such a group? Would God be pleased if you did? Would he consider that to be good stewardship? 
Now let's suppose that the federal government has created a new organization that will be financed by your taxes. Again, whether you like it or not. And that new organization will have one of two functions. It will either, one, use the tax money to print atheist propaganda to be distributed to high school and grade school students, or two, that tax money will be used to feed the homeless and take care of orphans and unwed mothers. Now, your involvement involves sending a self-addressed stamped envelope with your choice checked off to the, government, to the government office that gave you the envelope. The letters will then be tallied, and whichever view or vision has the most check marks, that is where the tax money will go. You decide you're not going to get involved, you don't send the letter. And the atheist organization with your tax money begins to distribute their propaganda to the high schools and the grade schools that your children happen to attend. You think God would be pleased with that? Now, we can't have a legitimate discussion about Christian involvement in politics without reading this passage from Romans chapter 13. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Now I've highlighted two things we can learn from this passage. Number one is governing authorities, i.e. government, has been created and established by God. And number two, government has been created and established by God for good. So whether it's city government, state government, federal government, these have all been created and established by God for good. And like it or not, when you buy things or pay taxes, you are involved in government activity. You are involved in politics. Now it's interesting that government has been created for our good, but at the time Paul wrote this letter, we know Christians were suffering tremendous persecution at the hands of the government. In fact, the Apostle Paul himself was beheaded by the Roman authorities. So how can Paul, assuming he's sane, write this to the church in Rome? Well, what we need to do is understand that government, politics, is a neutral concept it's an empty vessel to be filled with either good things or evil things, or things of no consequence at all. Politics is merely a tool to be used for good or for evil, and God created it to be used for good. As another example, look at the church. The church, like the government, was established by God to do good. Yet we see bad churches. We see churches rebuked by Jesus in the book of Revelation. We see churches split all the time and the heartache that can cause. And we see churches like Jonestown of the 1970s when 900 plus members of that congregation either committed suicide or were murdered. So how do these two things that God established for good end up 
doing evil. Edmund Burke was an Irish philosopher in the 1700s, and he said the following. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. How has this country gotten into the mess we're in? I believe to a large extent it's because good Christian men and good Christian women have done nothing. Little girl, Daddy, why are babies being torn apart inside their mommy's tummies? Dad, unfortunately since 1973 that's just what the law allows. Little girl, who decides what the laws are? Dad, uh, the people who vote do. Little girl, does that include us? Dad, no, we're, uh, we're Christians. We don't get involved in that. that that's, that's politics. Little girl, do the people who hate Jesus get involved in politics? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Little girl, dad, yes, they certainly do. Little girl, so they make the laws that allow babies to be killed. Dad, well, no, they don't make the laws. They vote for the people who make the laws. But yes, I guess you could say they make the laws that allow babies to be killed. Little girl, and there's nothing we can do about it. Dad, no, our hands are tied again. It's politics. Little girl. So politics is the one place we're not allowed to shine our light? <laughs> Dad, hadn't thought of it like that before, but I guess that's right. Little girl, that makes me sad. If Christians can't help the little babies, who will? <laughs> Reading again from the NIV. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Matthew chapter 4. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Satan has had a couple tricks that he has used throughout time to thwart the will of God. He flat out contradicts what God has said as he did in the garden. Or he accurately quotes scripture, but not in his proper context, as in the temptation of Christ. And I believe he has used both these techniques to get this country into the mess it's in right now. God tells us that he's created government as an instrument to do good. But the enemy says, no, 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 don't listen to that. Stay as far away from getting involved in that stuff as you can. Allow all the people on my side to do all that. You know, it's like the discussion we have in this country about the Second Amendment. People always want to blame guns, and people come back and say, guns don't kill people. Guns are neutral things. It's like a hammer. Hammers are made to do good things, but I can still use a hammer to kill somebody. And it's the same thing with government. It's there to do good, and we have an obligation to see that it does. So when Christians proudly proclaim their non-involvement in politics, they have believed the lie of the devil, one, 
Number two, it's not true. You are involved in politics if you buy things or pay taxes. And the country suffers either way. Let's look at another example that's a little more subtle. One often hears this passage quoted from Philippians 3 as a proof text for non-involvement in politics by Christians. Paul says, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Verse 20 to many is the end of discussion for Christian involvement in politics. Our citizenship is in heaven. But look closely at what Paul is saying there. Heavenly citizenship, that which is being contrasted with heavenly citizenship, is, are called enemies of the cross. He says their God is their stomach. They glory in their shame. Citizenship in heaven, on the contrary, implies instead of being enemies of the cross, we embrace the cross. Instead of having our sensual appetites as God, we have God as God, and we do not glory in shameful activities. Here's how one commentator puts it. Whose God is their belly? This describes the idolatry of these enemies. Not that they were necessarily focused on what they eat, But belly or stomach here has a broader reference to sensual indulgence in general. They live for the pleasures of the body, mind, and soul. Whose glory is in their shame. This shows the misplaced priorities of these enemies. They glorified about things they should have been ashamed of. Who set their mind on earthly things. This describes the focus of their life. It was not to please and worship God, but to get along in this world. Their attitude was the same as the rich fool in Luke 12, verses 16 through 21. Now to hear some Christians cite this passage as a proof text against involvement in the political process, here's how I see them understanding this passage. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For, as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. They glory in their shame. They vote to take advantage of the structure God has created to do good on earth. (laughs) Their God is their stomach. They glory in their shame. They vote for godly men and women who will pass laws to end the slaughter of the unborn. Their God is their stomach. They glory in their shame. They vote for presidential candidates they believe will appoint godly people to the courts. Their God is their stomach. They glory in their shame. They vote. So their children and grandchildren don't have to live in a land ruled by the ungodly. Their God is their stomach. They glory in their shame. They vote. So their children and grandchildren do not have to endure being labeled haters and bigots at school because they believe that gender is more than just a mental construct. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame. They vote. 
so their children and grandchildren will not be legally denied jobs or promotions because of their faith. Their God is their belly. They glory in their shame. They vote. So their children do not have to grow up in an environment where two men with beards are kissing in the park. And their God is their stomach and they glory in their shame. They vote. So those same two men do not have the right to go into the public restroom with their eight-year-old daughter. As Christians, we have many obligations in this life. Obviously, our primary focus is on seeking and saving the lost, but there's so much more to the Christian life than that. We are to serve and do good as we have opportunity. Here's how the Apostle Paul put it in Ephesians chapter 6. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. We have an opportunity as Christians to do good to all people. Because the God-fearing founders of this nation created us, created for us the ability to influence the government that God has created and to use it for his purposes. And just as a footnote, to those who say, change hearts and you'll change the culture. You can change all the hearts you want, but if, if in every one of those states, everyone were Christians, but one person, it's only those one non-Christians that voted, guess whose laws yeah. we will have to live under. That's right. So it takes more than changing hearts. Ashby, Lord willing, will be back uh, next Sunday. So I thank you uh, for coming.